Hi everyone, uh, this is Christina Rivera and you are welcome to another episode of the Church of the Larger Fellowships weekly talk show, The View. Um, I am going to introduce our, um, have our other hosts introduce themselves and we'll do a little bit of our weekly round, UU roundup and then introduce our guests today. Thank you so much, Sarah Green. I'm gonna be saying a bunch more about you in just a little bit. Um, but again, I'm Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, Meg, how are you doing? I am so excited that my computer's working. <laughs> Life small, small victories. I had to do a homily just as a podcast on Sunday night because I couldn't get video. So this is exciting. It's really good to see everyone. And um, spring has finally come. We're, we're getting ready. I was thinking how much you just don't do Good Friday. You know, we let's do the resurrection without talking about the crucifixion at all. Let's just skip that little irritating detail of crucifixion. So I've just been thinking about that as I get ready for, for the weekend with this little church that I'm working with in the suburbs here. Aisha, how are you? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser, and I'm finally back in Seattle. I was in New York City, then I went to Anchorage for an owl training, which was amazing with the Reverend Christopher Wolf, who's coming to West Seattle. I'm so excited. Um, and I'm feeling good. I, I think you make a very good point about Good Friday. We don't, and it's part of not wanting to sit in discomfort. Who wants to talk about something bad? Not us. Okay, I got to stop that. So everyone, I hope has a happy Easter. Uh, Dawn, how are you? Oh, um, thank you. I am doing well. I skidded in at the last minute because I was plagued with the blue screen of death. Uh, yeah, my, um, I think my um, computer might have uh, some sort of... Um, I'm trying to think of a, uh, an appropriate 21st century word for what we used to call a clap. Um, I think it's got a virus um, that is causing it. Yeah, I need like the, the computer equivalent of, of a shot of um, uh, Mel, <laughs> Meg just fell over. <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a, um, that's a first. Uh, no, it's just, it's, it's got something and it just, it's temperamental and moody. And some days it's just like, no, you need a break. I'm going to give you the blue screen of death. Go make coffee. Um, but yeah, here in South Jersey, it's awesome. The weather is a little wacky. It was 48 yesterday. It's going to be 74 tomorrow. Um, you know, I'm working in the shop. Um, making knives and and um doing my spiritual practice and it's very cool so margalee how are you i am doing just fine here in connecticut um cromwell to be exact uh weather since folks uh tend to want to talk about weather it's a little cloudy today but i love cloudy days you know i know it's like oh everybody wants the sunshine but i love cloudy days so and that's what um i have here today so I will be um, uh, making sure that the panelists here gets your question and comments and so on. So if you're on Facebook or Twitter and all that good stuff, I'll make sure that if you have a question or if you have a comment, if you want to say hello to someone, make sure that they get to hear all of that. Okay, back to you, Meg. Bum, Christina. <laughs> Rolling right along. Um, so one of the things I had for the UU Roundup was um, a shout out to Meadville Lombard Theological School, who has officially named uh, Dr. Elias uh, Ortega Aponte as their president, taking over for Reverend uh, Barker in, I think they said it will be all official over the summer, um, but just such a fabulous choice. Um, for Unitarian Coming Universalism. On to the view, right? What's up? Isn't he going to come and be a guest on The View? He is going to be a guest on The View. We're very excited about that. <laughs> so we will hear more about that, about that process. And um, he'll tell us, you know, everything that he's thinking about for Meadville. So that's really exciting news. Um, anybody I also want to jump in and say about Elias is he's probably the most humble human being I've ever met. He's so brilliant. Of course, I mean, I'm friends with him, but 
I obviously he he found out because after it happened after the announcement was made, I'm like, dude, we were just in Miami. He found out the Friday before finding our way home. So he was with us, did not let on anything, and just is such a kind, open-hearted human being that I'm so thrilled for both our seminaries. Um, and I'm really, really wow. I'm so I can't wait to have him on and and talk to him. While we're talking seminaries, I'll lift up that uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Rosemary Bray McNatt sent out an email about big changes coming to Star King. Looks like they're moving out of their building at least temporarily and really reconsidering what it means to be sustainable at this time, which of course all the seminaries are doing. So um, shout out to them. We have a fabulous board member, Charles Dumond, who's just finishing the CLF board and has moved over to Star King. And I wrote to him and said, oh, you know, you came in at quite a time. And he said, you know, I knew I was going to that and I'm the chair of the fundraising committee. And I thought they couldn't do better. He's fantastic. And, and you know, they do such important work in multi-religiosity and, you know, all the things that they've done around anti-oppression for so long. And so, yeah, I just want to shout out to both the seminaries. It's really exciting to see how the education's changing. And I can only hope and pray that the congregations want the kind of leaders that the seminarians are sending out. Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about that a little bit about the past two, two episodes about ministerial formation and so many, um, you know, folks that are coming out of ser seminary are, can, are going into community ministry um, because our congregations are, um, you know, not really doing the work that the that a lot of people are feeling called to do when they're when they're following a call from the holy, however they they identify that, and um, and so what does it mean for our congregations to kind of look and see how they are um, how they are embodying Unitarian Universalism in a way that. Um, maybe shifts how they experience Unitarian Universalism. So it's gonna be interesting to see, uh, especially where, where these two seminaries go. I see that uh, Thompson wrote in about, uh, love talking about this whole week, Good Friday, Judas, and how it's always been the state that will try to kill justice. Yep, that's for sure. Good Friday I know. And uh, just to shout out while we're talking about side with love, um, that, um, Elizabeth Wynn has decided to move on from there. And she has been such a key minister for so many of us. She wants to do local activism. And I wrote to her and said, lucky for the local activists and I will miss your ministry so much. So I know that she's staying right in the movement doing what her call is. And I'll really miss her where she's been. Just wanted to shout that out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just a continuing um, shout out to Blue for their um, babies and bailouts and money bail. Um, they're gonna be doing a Facebook Live panel. They're inviting people to have watch parties for that. Super, super easy to do that. You can do it with one, two, five, 20, however many people you want. Um, they've got all the instructions on their Facebook and website. So folks should definitely go check that out so we can be living into our Unitarian Universalist value. There's um, reward yeah. of money on the planet, I think, to imagine that your money is going to help reunite a mom and a kid. I mean, what, what could knit back together more effectively this mess that we're in than knowing that every one of those reunitings is, is a bond of love? So yeah, it's, it's really, I'm, I love that movement. I love Southerners on New Ground and all the people have been working on that movement. And I love how wholeheartedly Blue has jumped into that. It's really exciting and great for the movement. And I also want to say it was Kiana Perkins, the social justice director. I'm not sure what her exact title is in the Ann Arbor UU congregation where um, Manish Mishra is the senior minister, Marzetti. Um, Kiana Perkins is a Blue member who came up with uh, the entire babies and bailout initiative. So yay. Big time, yay. Um, and then I just, you know, I think as a program that is based, you know, within religion, it would be remiss of us not to um, mention the, the fire at uh, Notre Dame. And what I have really appreciated um, is the deep conversations 
um, that I've seen occur on Facebook about what it means to um, hold as sacred a, a symbol of colonialism and of colonizing. And um, also I've seen a lot of posts really talking about the coverage that that has uh, garnered versus the coverage of the three black churches in Louisiana that have been torched, um, as well as the coverage of the arson um, by white supremacists at uh, Highlander Center. And um, so I, I just really, I encourage people to keep those conversations going because I think that that's part of, of our collective faith work. Don, were you trying to say something? You're muted, if so. Yeah, um, I unmuted and then I was like, nah, I don't need to. Um, but one of the things I heard was um, on public radio the other day was that um, there was a conversation about the deaths in, and I'm going to be horrible, the, the East African countries as a result of the cyclone. A thousand people killed, hundreds of thousands of people displaced, and there was no six hour wall to wall block of broadcast coverage of that, like there was for, you know, the collection of art and history and, and all of the colonialism that goes with that. And nobody died. Nobody died, but a thousand people died in East Africa. And, and I, still, I still sat there and wept watching it burn, you know? Um, so much art, so much beauty, so much. And, and, and we can do beautiful things for all the wrong reasons, and they're still beautiful. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's so complex. I don't have anything particularly pithy to say. It's just, there's so much loss of life that didn't get covered. And um, I have a real hunch as to why that was. Um, and uh, 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 another thing that did get covered that didn't involve any loss of life, although we'll see what happens with the first responders um, because all of the paint, I mean, the roof of Notre Dame was lead. And that melted and poured down. All of the paints that they used back then had lead and cadmium and all manner of awful things in them. So, um, and the glass was all leaded um, and held together with lead. So um, there will be deaths, but it'll be the first responders who die. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a direction with that. It's just, it's just this complex mishmash of thoughts and feelings and frustration, I guess. Well, I likened it to when an abusive parent dies. And that's what I posted because the back and forth, don't, don't let me not grieve. I could cry all I want. Hey, everybody, I mean, this back and forth was just getting a little bit, peep, I, I don't, I mean, it was, it was interesting to watch. And then I said, oh, this is like when somebody who was abusive your whole life, but yet let's say was a public, you know, I was actually thought of mommy dearest and, and like this girl had this horrific mother. And then, um, but so that's what it feels like. I mean, actually Notre Dame represents some pretty terrible things. Sure. It's pretty. I just, I've been there. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know. I, and you know, that made people feel things and it's, rep and it, and it's, the fact that so much death is going on that isn't being paid attention to in, attention to in that way speaks to who we are as humans and what we value. And we value things and things that we attach stories to and meaning rather than people. Well, and I, I just wanna, on the, on the flip side of that is, we have theologians who have written powerful, true things who have behaved horribly, does that, does their behavior negate the validity of their work? I mean, what do we do with Forest Church? You know, who talked about morality and sin? Huh? Really? That took some cheek, you know, but, but those words are still valid. 
So what do we do with that? I mean, that's just a, like we, we're not good with this discomfort. So we that's what we do with it. We don't. Well, it's complicated, and, but I do hear all the white fragility of you're telling me I can't be sad. And I've never seen anyone say you can't be sad. It's just put a story around the sadness. Let's look at it. Let's examine it. Let's think about, as Aisha said, property versus human life. Let's look at how our values are shaped. I mean, right. I and and what that says about like, like you were saying, um, you know, over a billion dollars already raised for that rebuilding. Um, you know, it, it says exactly, you know, where we want to put our resources and, and, um, and it's not for, you know, East African countries of people dying. Right. Um, so within Unitarian Universalism, we are, you know, we're called to, to witness to that and to, I think, to give voice to, to that full picture, like you're saying, Meg, I think that's, that's what we're, what we're looking for. So, um, Sarah Green is here. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yay! <laughs> um, so Sarah, I, I could probably say your title if I like picture it, but do you want to introduce yourself and what you do? Yeah. So I'm Sarah Green. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am calling in from Knoxville, Tennessee, on my way to Highlander um, for the weekend, to be really uh, tender, um, but great. Um, I live in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, it's about an hour and a half south of Nashville. Um, and I work at the UUA as Youth Young Adults of Color Ministry Associates. Blah, blah, blah. That thing. And so my job is caring for advocating for and with struggling for and with young people of color who identify as UU and also who are UU adjacent. Um, and I know that's a, a loaded term, but I, it feels important to me um, to honor the, the ways people choose to um, or not endure all of the things we got going on in this, <laughs> in this world, in this UU situation. Um, so that's what I do. I work with Bart and Jenica and the, the administrative maven, Deborah and Ted and the Youth Office of Youth and Young Adult Ministry. Yeah, from New Orleans originally. Uh, I went to Vanderbilt for Divinity School, did my internship in Nashville and will be ordained on May 4th. So that's kind of uh, part of who I'm accountable to is the MFC. There are others. Thanks for having me, y'all. It's good to get in on the action. So, um, Sarah, a lot of folks don't know that there's um, a youth and young adult ministry within the UUA. Like, I, I, I'm always surprised when I tell people, hey, you know, there's a resource for this. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about what um, kind of like the, not just the resources, but like kind of the framing of why we have um, this, this particularly named ministry? Yeah, and I, I bet you'd probably get different answers if you asked my coworkers about it. Um, one of the one of the answers that I give about why we have resources devoted to young people, it, and this is a selfish one, is that when young people have, when I don't have the clarity about what we're doing and why young people do, and it's a way for uh, for me to be in followership to be in that office. Um, John, John's like, ooh. Um, so that's that's one that's one uh, not a reason, but. Um, a, a note of impact of like they have some serious clarity about why we're still here that you know on the day-to-day -day, it's just hard um and that's fine because i don't i don't have to have the clarity because they are there um the other reason is because um you know that the, the phrase of like uh 
they are the future, but like that's obviously partially true because they're here now. Um, and they are faithful and they are um, creatures with spiritual depth and they are, they are humans with vision um, and a clarity of articulation um, and more than just valid, but like precious resources to, to our faith. Um, and what you do with precious resources is that you support them um, and you struggle alongside them to make sure that they um, have space in the conversation. If not, if they're not leading it, that's the preference, they're leading it. Um, but at the very least, um, that they have space in the conversation. They have advocates who um, hold other older adults accountable. That's, 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 I think, some of the ways or the reasons why we have a youth and young adult ministry. Obviously, the practical reasons of like, we lose a lot of young people. Uh, and so this office is um, dedicated to helping folks transition from youth and emerging adults to adults um, and, and to be in struggle there because our congregations are not meeting their needs um, for a lot of different reasons. Similar, I, I would argue, to why many ministers are going into community um, ministry. Sink has a question for you. So I'm curious, I've watched this evolve over years. We watched it go from a full-time job to a half-time job a while back. What, what programmatically is going on at this point and how is it rebuilding some of the stuff that was taken down? Is it all new? Just how's it going? Well, we got a lot of pots boiling. <laughs> that is true. Um, so, so Jenica has uh, a really incredible portfolio for adult for for youth, including summer seminary, including GA youth. Note, there's a there was a name change. Used to be youth caucus, now it's GA youth. Um, so she holds a lot of that, and then there's a the young adult stuff, which is like meaning makers, um, event wise, and young adults at GA. And then my pot of things, although I'm doing some emerging adult things too. My part of things is specifically Thrive events. So those are events for youth and young adults of color um, and grow, which uh, has an interesting history, um, but it's a multiracial space by people and people of color uh, focused on healing justice um, for people who are doing work in our communities and our congregations. Um, and then, so those are, that's the big pot. We do share some other pots, um, like the youth ministry revival with this thing called the youth round table. Not only do we have, a, we have an office, which is awesome. We have a round table composed of UUA staff, um, both Yaya, the office of youth Journals, and um, youth round table, which is congregational life staff. And they have been for the past three years having a youth revival. Um, so that's something that we don't we don't own. Actually, congregational life staff really kind of holds that. Um, but we show up and is that a national event or a regional event or what is that? It's a national event. It has been rotating around the country. So the first one, um, I was not really around, but I it was in the Pacific Northwest region. And then the year after that, Nancy Combs Morgan had it somewhere. I'm not sure where it was. And then this past year, it was in um, the DMV area. Uh, and we're still figuring out where it will be um, next year. But that's kind of a rotating event. But national, yes, with you, with lots and lots of youth leaders. Um, so is it a weekend or a week long or a weekend friday okay. to sunday so you know someone's coming from california they're probably not going to go to dc for the weekend but it could happen and it has been known to happen um lots of youth on ga youth staff just flew to spokane washington for the weekend so we do know how to travel um so that's kind of the pot that we're the pots that we're working with um we also do a lot of 
consultations with congregations. Um, we do a lot of advocacy and other departments for you working on finding a youth, couple of like youth trustee position, something. Um, so we do a lot of informal work too, alongside the program. I have a question, um, if I may. Um, so I was at the UUA when uh, the youth, continental youth events was no more. And I know there's literally still pain around that. So are the revivals, which every time one happens, people are so grateful. And they're one, I know when it, I didn't go to the one here, but I know folks who did go just loved it. Um, is this a way to bring back some national opportunities for youth uh, uh, to get together, um, to, to basically replace what was lost in a much more intentional way? And, and the other thing is, I do think it's important for folks to, I, I don't know if folks realize how important it is that we also ha pay attention to youth of color, um, who, I mean, adults of color feel isolated and have all kinds of feelings and microaggressions. It is amplified for youth, especially when they're isolated. Um, so I guess it's two things, the response to the, why are you, you going away, continental, and um, speak to focusing on youth of color. Yes. Um, so oh, that's a big statement to say that, that that is the that is the intention behind it, just because there's so much there. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I guess my I want my answer to be, well, let's see if um, if if that's what it evolves to be instead of like projecting like this is what it's going to be. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm interested in like, you know, what's our capacity <laughs> to do this kind of event. Um, and what are what are the results? What are, what are we seeing it do? What's the what's the function of it? So that we can then follow it up with the form of those big statements of like, ta-da! That thing that everyone has been waiting for years for. Um, and I think that's particularly strategic because um, of the missteps and what wasn't so healthy about why are you you and con con. So, so, so making a big statement would just set us up for um, not not being able to move as intentionally as. So, sorry. Um, and so, one of the things that we're working through is our youth want spiritual depth. Half, I mean, a, a lot of youth go to seminary because they want rigor. They want theological rigor and spiritual practice. And as someone who I'm sure other people can test. As someone who's been through the basic school seminary, all that, it's just like not worth the debt. <laughs> like rigor is, that's not it. Um, and in fact, that's what church is supposed to be for. So, um, so, that, so that's one thing we're trying to give the youth spiritual depth, spiritual practice, a sense of like, who are we? Where have we been? Where are we going? Um, and we're trying all so that's one part of what we're trying to finesse and then the other thing that we're trying to finesse is this is not like a youth free for all do everything youth um everything is up to you that was another misstep so i've heard and so which we're, we are and it's an imperfect art of youth leadership i think this is how i want to describe it um because a, it's not really been done before by us in a way that feels good, in a way that the youth um, are present and, sh uh, and show up and like lend us their brilliance, or lend themselves their brilliance really, um, in ways that feel sustainable for them. So that's, I think we're, that's, that's another thing that we're, I think we're wrestling with um, in this new iteration of uh, national youth events. Um, and, you know, obviously, untangling white supremacy is like a whole thing. At the con, before the con, after the con. I mean, it's just like that, I think, what I have noticed is just that makes people move slower in, in the best way. Um, and so it's not just about, well, did the youth have a great time? Um, it's about how did the people who are working on it what, how, what did, they, did they leave drained? Did they leave harmed? Did they leave 
um, empty or do they leave full and restored and, and, and a little more healed? And so that's the other like third piece of the pie that um, we're working on before I think we say like, yeah, the Tada moment. Um, India, McKnight told me that youth of color, uh, so it is a thing that there are a lot of youth color, of color in leadership, like um, proportion wise. And India said that's because that's where they find community. And I was like, dang, India, just dropping it right there. Um, so that's a thing, because <laughs> the way that we're doing leadership is youth leadership is unsustainable. And, you know, adding just, just like the, the basics of that being sustainable, plus being a youth of color, um, and the pressure to, to stay and keep applying and remain in these positions, that's where your friends are. Something that we really need to figure out. Um, so we're doing that in a couple of different ways. Um, partially, it looks like me being more involved in GA youth stuff. Um, the, the youth are more, so there's a youth of color coordinator, there's two on GA youth staff. And their job is to create spaces for youth of color to feel welcomed. Um, and to sort of navigate GA. And that's, a, that's a, maybe a three year position or not uh, like it's been around for three years. Um, and so I'm their, I'm their adult staff person, but I'm also there just to like keep an eye on how the youth culture is um, in the staff group uh, and to be available for the youth of color who are not supposed to be youth of color coordinators, but maybe the deans or maybe um, worship, you know, there's, they're there, we're everywhere. Um, so that's one way that is less about making a whole new program, but it's more about changing the way we do programs. And then there's Thrive Youth, um, which I inherited from Elizabeth. And um, yeah, there's some grief there around her departure, but luckily she's my mentor to the MFC. So I'm like, gotcha. Woo. Uh, so this iteration of Thrive, um, and it was really inspired by our last uh, grow, which was last fall in Minneapolis um, with Mooshja, shout out to Ashley and Danny, um, and Elizabeth and Angela Kelly, who really worked some magic. But what- So we, Sarah, before you, before you talk about this iteration of Thrive, can you talk about what Thrive is and who attends? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what it what it used to be known as because some folks still remember it as that other thing yes so thrive youth is a a, a five-day program for people who have completed ninth grade people who have completed their senior year of high school um youth of color um and it has i think wavered between a, a workshop space for um spiritual development and leadership. So obviously, obviously some of the leadership things are, are how we got all these leaders, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, we talked about that. Um, but it really has been uh, more flexible in terms of, is it for spiritual development? Is it to nurture and, and nourish youth of color? Or is it to, um, develop leaders obviously it's a false dichotomy um, but what's easier to do is youth, is youth leadership I think that's the easier choice um, that's where we have been where we're going is um, a workshop that is focused and grounded in place as the starting point for spiritual development and thusly leadership um, and I wouldn't even say leadership, I would say based in place and thusly a, a, a more clear articulation of how we show up as you use in the world. And so uh, that looks like spending a lot of time getting to know the stories of the place that we're at. 
Um, so in Minneapolis, we had Danny and um, Ashley who are so strongly rooted in Minneapolis and, and that organizing work, they were able to give us a really great orientation um, to place along with People's Movement Center. Um, so we're hoping that that's the first thing we do is like, what is the history of, of people of color, of indigenous people, of queer people? Danny would say some Paul, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> we were technically in St. Paul. <laughs> Um, so, so this year um, in Minneapolis again for Thrive Youth. And so we'll get to know the story of, of place where we're at. And then I wanna dive into the stories of where the youth are from. Like what, like what is the story of where you come from? Um, that might involve a little bit of like storytelling, um, digging and, yeah and then from that place move into like okay how do how do we show up in the world um and still rooted in place we hope to be working with a food justice organization to be like okay like um as, as a critical justice issue <laughs> um how is food how is food accessible here what about in your hometown like what what is our where's our agency as young people to do something about it on whatever level we have the capacity for. Um, and being able to, to draw that line from the prince, from place to principles, to sources, to action. Um, I think so, we to the prince of oh, Well, I was just gonna say, I think that's super important, um, particularly where you're having thrive, you know, in Minneapolis and, and um, that you do have, you know, such a, a rich source of history right there. And, I, and when I say history, I mean like, you know, year, six months history, <laughs> not, not, not even, you know, the longer history, but, um, and, and I do think it's really, so my kids went to thrive um, when it was just becoming thrive and it was still, thrive used to be called multicultural leadership school. And so it was this, it was the first year it was Thrive. I think it was the first or second year it was Thrive, um, but it still had a lot of the leadership school flavor. Um, and thus they are now, you know, youth leaders. And I think um, you're right that, that it, it's not, it doesn't have to be a false dichotomy of one or the other. And I love that what you're bringing to this is, you know, how to be able to have, to hold both of those but in a more, in a way that is more, um, in my opinion, at least, um, more true to Unitarian Universalism, to being more spiritually grounded for the youth. And, and because of that, then um, I think things like the youth revival, um, Liz uh, Brewer-Martin said uh, on our comments that she took five youth along to the Portland one and it was a life-changing experience for everyone. Um, I, my kids were on staff for the one in um, Cedar Lane this past, what was it, winter, spring, um, and it was the largest one they'd had. I mean, there, there were over, I think there were, there were like 95 youth, 75 adults. It was, it was really, really well attended and large, and um, and it wasn't just it wasn't just growth for growth's sake. There was a real hunger for being able to be youth rooted in Unitarian Universalism, um, and I think that natural outgrowth of leadership and community for youth of color is is real. Um, because if you looked at the youth team for that revival, um, it was way skewed to youth of color. Um, and if you, you know, you look at GA youth, um, that is way skewed to youth of color. And in some ways, I think because we've been so intentional about supporting them and in ways that we haven't been as intentional of just supporting youth, right? Um, so I wonder if like the change with River Rising, which used to be gold mine, um, will start to percolate some of that as well. And I just want to say before we move into that, that 
you know, I, I, re, I have a 22 year old kid who's a kid of color. There was nothing, we came along right in that vacuum. And my kids consequently totally disconnected from Unitarian Universalism, except for like, bless Hope and Janice Marie Johnson, who have really stepped in as wonderful nurturing figures and gotten Jai to go on the civil rights legacy tour and other things. But in terms of youth and young adult companionship, absolutely not there. And it broke my heart because I, I think it can be really life-saving for people, especially for adopted kids of color with white parents to find, um, find that. My kid found it through activism, you know, and, and that's okay. There's a lot here in the Twin Cities to do that. But I really regretted not having that spiritual depth. And um, so, but I just wanted to ask you, Sarah, because I was the youth director back in 1989 to 1992. And um, when I hear what a failure it was, I'm like, well, no, not completely. I mean, I feel like what really failed was adults standing by and not fleeing and being present and supporting and not leaving. And um, I mean, I understood not doing con con. That was a very stressful week. I never slept at all. But, but you know, I just, the idea of destroying that because it wasn't perfect uh, without replacing it, as everyone knows, is a source of great grief and bitterness for me about our faith. So I'm really excited to hear what you're saying. I wonder, is there commitment on a board and senior staff level to the youth movement? And you may not be able to answer that, but I will say that absent that, it's not going to go where it needs to go. And um, so I see you smiling. I used to work at the UUA too. Christina was on the board. There are things you can say and can't say. But I will say, having been there at all levels, that without leadership from the absolute top that understands that youth are the vitality of the movement now and into the future, we are not a religion. We are a club. And so I have made my statement, but I just... You can take that wherever you want to go. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that that commitment, I think that I wasn't here when YRU was disbanded, obviously. So a lot of what I know is just hearsay of, of who I'm around, really. But I, I um, and about your kids, I think first I'll say, I do feel that vacuum in other in in, in my world too, even like in my peers, um, and I and I know that um, my core group of UU friends came from Thrive, um, and they, we're, most of us are we're in seminary or religious educators, religious professionals of something. Um, so that that also feels like an interesting trend too, of like okay, there's there's folks who left. Um, because of this, this loss and the people who are coming back, um, they connect through Thrive and then something happens where they, they only show up to events where they get paid. So that's interesting, but like, it's a whole other thing of like, when do you, when do young adults of color, young people of color get to just show up, uh, and not do a thing? not be in charge of the thing. That's another thing that I think is exciting about Thrive is that like um, not in charge of the thing. Like it's to be, I mean, we're co-creating space, right? We're collaborating. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but they're not expected to hold anyone's spirit or logistics or anything like that. Um, I think of the commitment that I'll say from the institution is that I'm appreciating the slowness with which they're moving and the action that they are taking. Um, and the wrestling of it all, of how to do it. So I'm not here to say that like, there's this grand statement, commitment vision, because there's not. And I mean, I don't want to pretend. <laughs> Integrity is very important to me. Um, so I'm going to lie. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not wrestling of how to do it, who it needs to come from, and what needs to happen before, during, and after um, that. So the so so uh, the things that are happening is the trustee um, position 
um, an youth observer, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like on the sideline of that conversation. It, it used to be the youth observer. It is now the youth trustee. Okay, great. Yeah. That's what I, I thought. Um, so that's happening. And the, I mean, the round table really is holding a lot, like a lot of it alongside the office. Um, and really, and there's, there's a lot of grief in the, in the round table too that we're, that we're wrestling with about support like they're of an institutional uh, for you. Um, and so we're in a process right now to figure out like, okay, we have a couple of round tables, I mean, uh, revivals under our belt. How have they gone? How, um, how do we wanna move forward? What's our, what's our, what's our role? Um, and what's the, uh, the process? It's kind of awkward on the round table because like the UUA, there's like Yaya staff and then there's Congregation Life staff and we're trying to wrestle with how do we make decisions about what we're doing. And that's slow and tedious work um, for that. And then in the Yaya office, we this fall had a week of meetings. It was a lot, but we revised our mission um, through a collaborative process that involved Deborah and Ted, who work a lot with the youth and have um, a lot of brilliance to share. Um, and I might, I might try to look for it, but I will say that the first three words are um, with boldness, playfulness, and joy. I and, love that. I love that. That's so great. <laughs> uh, I'll start the first part. Oh, go, and then the last part of the mission just before you go is about holding ourselves and the institution accountable to young people. Yeah, That's, those are those are some of the highlights. And and I think that part of um, of why youth and young adults of color come specifically when they're in leadership, I think some of that is self protection, right? Like you can attend an event that you are in leadership of because you can control to some degree the amount of microaggressive, macroaggressive um, space that is held. Whereas when you go as a participant, um, the likelihood of that happening um, is, is greatly increased. I mean, I know from myself, I'm much more comfortable in UU spaces than I'm leading because I can make sure that there's at least space um, somewhere <laughs> to be held for, for all of that that's gonna happen. Um, so I, I, I kind of get that for them. Um, I want to get one comment in from, from somebody from on, um, and then Aisha has a question. Um, so Ty, where was it? Ty Resendez de Perez says, so much of Thrive is creating a space where youth of color can be present in both of their racial identity and their spiritual identity, which is so true. It really gives them tools to live into their whole beautiful multifaceted identity and feel what a loving and challenging spiritual community can be. So true. Um, and I know Aisha has. Well, one, one of the, one of my disappointments, it, well, one of our missing opportunities, our missed opportunities when we, in our ministerial formation process is how little attention we pay to youth ministry. That it's almost an afterthought. If someone doesn't make it part of what they want to be and how they're formed, um, it just doesn't happen. You could go through the, maybe that's changing and I'm, you know, let's, it maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm not going through it. I'm in the credentialing, uh, for RE, but, and it, the, to me, um, I, I think I've said this before, but I'm going to repeat it. When I had a minister, a female minister, a female identified minister say to me, or you, you ordained, I'm child phobic thinking she was funny. And I'm like, huh. And I had another friend say to me, the Methodist would never ordain someone who, think it's, who thinks it's funny to stay away from children. And that, would, that indicates to me that we don't have integral in our, who we are in our DNA and our ministerial formation process that we take seriously ministry to all ages. So then that's why we're spending years. How do we do this? How do we do this? How do we keep people? How do we, do we let youth minister to themselves and hope for the best and empower them? And what, what 
it's a, to me, it's a, it's a colossal missed opportunity with who we are that we make as an afterthought ministry with two children and youth. Yeah, I mean, I think your assessment of the process is right on on this. I mean, they're talking about big changes, but in, in the one that I went through, um, totally, uh, yeah, not required. Um, I do see younger ministers in formation and ministers of color more attentive to that. Um, and yeah, that's that's what I think um, because we know the, the value of, of of seeing ourselves early on, um, even like as as queer people, like um, doing that ministry to let people to let queer and trans people know that you like you can get old, like you you uh, you deserve to age. Um, it motivates some folks um, to do that before they get a job at a, in a Well, we are coming towards the top of our hour. I want to make sure that um, you tell people who are listening or watching, if somebody wants to participate in all of these fabulous programs, how do they do that? <laughs> and then um, anything that we haven't asked you that you think is important to know about, um, let us know. Well, if someone is interested in applying or getting involved, they can obviously email me, sgreen at uua.org. Um, I'm also available on Facebook. It's pretty, pretty work-focused Facebook. Um, so feel free to hit me up on there. And then um, we have some registrations rolling out. Um, right now, the Thrive Youth uh, registration is out, and I just put the link in the Zoom chat. Can, uh, hope someone can transfer that over. Um, uh, Thrive Young Adults should be out this week, and that's happening Labor Day weekend in New Orleans. So, whoop, whoop. I'm excited to like dig into the histories of of laborers uh, in New Orleans, of which you know there are obviously plenty. Uh, I mean, yeah grow in later in the summer um i think also if someone's like i don't know if this is for me still it sounds great but i'm just not sure or like i want to get plugged in in other ways um also email me call me beat me if you want to reach me um the other thing um i just want to i just want people to know that we're wrestling alongside y'all and like uh, that we, 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 we want to be in accountable, we, the youth nugget office, it's specific, <laughs> um, want to be in accountable relationships with young people. Um, so if, if people want to be in conversation, our office is committed to long-term, how do we do this better? What is the impact of our work, good or not so good or harmful? Um, and, and what do young people need from us? Not that they carry the brunt of articulating that, um, but if they have feedback, as a, as we would appreciate the gift. The, of, of that. That's cool. not, yeah. And I would, um, you know, I will remind folks that um, when all the shit went down in 2017, um, it was the youth and young adult office that took upon themselves to do an internal racism audit of their own processes and how they were positioned and, um, and then gave the gift. I mean, they didn't just do that. Then they gave the gift of sharing that very openly with Unitarian Universalism. Um, and you can still read that blog uh, post about how they went about doing that. Um, and it was, it was beautiful. It was one of the most, um, that I experienced as one of the most faithful parts of, um, of what was happening around the, you know, around the time of the white supremacy teach-ins. And 
Um, and, and it was just, it was, it was gorgeous. It was a gorgeous piece of modeling, um, not for the sake of modeling because you all did it for yourselves and then said, yeah, yeah, we can share this. I have a question. What about those of us who aren't youth or young adults um, and won't be applying to go to, to those trainings? How can we support this work? Whether we're lay leaders, religious educators, whoever we are. Tell youth of color that you know. Most people go to five events because they hear it from a youth professional or a parent or a minister. And it's amazing people that I'm like, that I meet at Laredo or wherever that I'm like, oh, you know, do, do you know about Thrive? And they're like, they have no idea. <laughs> and so um, there's still a lot of outreach, communication, spreading the word that we have to do, but people have to care. I mean, which sounds like, I'm assuming that you're asking this because you care, <laughs> but we need more people who care to let the young people of color in their lives know. Uh, and then I would say, if you don't know a young person of color in your life, reflect on that situation. <laughs> that would be, that would be that set of works. First works over, so. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming. And Sarah came on very short notice as well. So thank you for working us into your schedule. We really appreciate it. And um, next week on The View, we have Julie Taylor coming to talk to us about trauma response ministry and trauma ministry. The words trauma-informed ministry are starting to be bandied about quite a bit in UU circles. And we on The View thought it would be great to get a baseline understanding of what it actually means before people uh, start co-opting it to mean what they want it to mean. So join us next week as we go through that. Any last words, anybody? I hear congratulations on your ordination. Sarah is our last words coming in from Shakira, but also from all of us. Hooray. Thanks. Thanks for having me, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.